Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This day in sports history. It's February 21st, and on this day in 1980, it was a huge win for a tiny country. Liechtenstein. It's not easy to say, and it's also a very tiny country. It's about the size of Washington, D.C., with a lot less people. You could fit about 16 Liechtensteins inside the state of Rhode Island, assuming no traffic. And you didn't make many turns. It would take you about a half hour to drive from one side of the country to the other. Uh, Today, the population is about 40,000. But back in 1980, the population of Liechtenstein was about 20,000. Now, to put that into perspective, the seating capacity for Madison Square Garden for a basketball game is around 19,500. So you could just about put the entire 1980 population of Liechtenstein into MSG to watch some hoops if you, you know, really wanted to. Okay, so you're probably wondering, why am I giving you all this information about tiny Liechtenstein? Well, in 1980, Liechtenstein's Hani Wenzel won the country's first ever Olympic gold medal, doing it in the women's giant slalom by less than a half second over her closest competitor. Just two days later, she added another gold in the slalom to go along with a surprise silver that she had won in the downhill event back on the 17th. Interestingly, her brother Andreas was competing as well, and he spent a lot of time on the podium winning a silver and a bronze in Lake Placid that year. Listen, I get it. Liechtenstein, it's a snowy, mountainous country. It's got rough alpine terrain. Average elevation of the country is like 6,000 feet. That's higher than Denver in the Rockies, where they ski. Why shouldn't Liechtenstein have good skiers? Well, it's about money and resources. In 1980, Liechtenstein had a GDP of about half a billion dollars. What, did I tune into the Motley Fool podcast, you may be asking? We're talking GDP now? Yeah, well, just hang with me for a second. Compare Liechtenstein's half a billion with that of Switzerland's $123 billion in 1980, and it puts into perspective what countries have to spend on things like, you know, funding Olympic dreams. And listen, here's another thing. It's not like Liechtenstein just started sending athletes to the Olympics in the 70s or 80s, right? The country had been sending athletes to the Olympics since 1936. And so from then until now, in 2024, Liechtenstein has only won a total of 10 Olympic medals. And the Wenzel family actually owns six of them. Five of them won at the Lake Placid Olympics in 1980. Also on this day, in 1970, future NBA stars Pete Maravich and Dan Issel dueled each other in a college basketball game. This game wasn't exactly a classic, but these two did put on a show that night. Maravich had been a scoring machine since he came to LSU. Back then, freshmen were not allowed to play on the varsity, but in the three years that he had played, he had already surpassed Oscar Robertson as the most prolific scorer in NCAA Division I history. He still holds that record. Just two weeks prior to this game, Maravich had put up 69 points in a loss to Alabama to set the single-game scoring record against a Division I opponent, a mark that would not be topped for another 21 years. Pete averaged 44.5 points a game this particular season, 1970, and he was on his way to being named the College Player of the Year by the Sporting News and the Naismith Award winner as the best player in college basketball in 1970. On the other bench was Dan Issel, who also was a senior in 1970. He was putting up some decent numbers. He averaged 33 points and 13 rebounds a game that year. The Wildcats led by eight at the half, and then they steadily pulled away in the second with Issel hitting layups and baseline jumpers to power Kentucky to the 121-105 win. Issel had 51 points on the night. Maravich poured in 64. But once again, his point explosion came in a losing effort. 
It was the third time that season that he had scored more than 60 in a game, and the second time it had been in a losing effort. The Maravich show would press on, receiving an invite to play on the NIT at Madison Square Garden at the end of the year, largely because people wanted to see Pistol Pete play a little bit more. Back then, the NCAA tournament only invited 25 teams, and the NIT invited 16. For LSU, it was the only postseason appearance between 1954 and 1979, and it was largely due to what Pete Maravich did on this night and every night that season. As for Issel and his Wildcats, they were the top-ranked team heading into the NCAA tournament, but they would be upset by Artis Gilmore and the Jacksonville Dolphins in the third round. But at least on this night, both stars shone brightly with a glimpse of things to come in a few years in the pros. Also on this day, in 1954, men's figure skater Dick Button became the first to ever land a triple jump in competition. And in 1979, two Iowa girls high school basketball teams played a scoreless four quarters. It was 0-0 at the end of regulation. It took double overtime to decide a winner with a final score of 4-2. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows... Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, Fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.